Is the divide between Catholicism and biblical Christianity wider than we think? Now imagine a crossroads where faith meets tradition, scripture, and interpretation. This is where Catholicism and biblical Christianity diverge, each taking a path that has shaped the lives of millions. What lies at the heart of these differences? Let's take a closer look and find out. Hello everybody, welcome again to this channel where we talk about spiritual matters. In today's video we're discussing about baptism. Not only baptism, but infant baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is an important ceremony in Christianity. It represents the forgiveness and remission of sins that believers receive through this covenant of grace with Jesus Christ. It is an outward demonstration of the transformation of new birth in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an act of obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ because Jesus commanded us to get baptized. It also reflects a believer's willingness to follow Christ's example and teachings, being a servant of God, marking a significant step in Christian life. In other words, you can say that baptism in Christianity speaks primarily of the personal public identification with Jesus Christ. It shows that a person chooses to belong to Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, it has deep symbolism as well. In Romans chapter 6 verse 3 and 4, the Bible says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So baptism symbolizes a new life, dying to self and being born again in newness of life, the life that is in Jesus Christ. Baptism should be a happy ceremony for any Christian because it has deep meaning and should be taken seriously by anyone willing to get baptized. Jesus himself chose to be baptized by John at the beginning of his public ministry. John the Baptist was calling the Jewish people to confess their sins and demonstrate repentance through immersion in the Jordan River. And then sinless Jesus came and joined the crowd at the river and asked John to baptize him. Why? Why did Jesus come to John and wanted to be baptized? The Lord chose to affiliate himself with sinful man to set an example. When we follow his example in the baptismal water, we're publicly confessing our faith in the Savior and identifying ourselves with Him. Although baptism is very important as a testimony of faith in Jesus Christ, what is more important is the new birth, being born again with water and the Spirit. This is the biggest lesson Jesus wanted to teach us in relation to the Kingdom of God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. How about infant baptism? Should babies be baptized? Is it important for infants to be baptized? These are some of the questions we are going to go into in today's video. In biblical Christianity, baptism is for believers that accept Christ and become his disciples. In Catholicism, babies are baptized. Why? Because of the sin of Adam and the idea that they have original sin and they couldn't enter into heaven with that original sin. In this video, we're talking about infant baptism and why Catholics baptize babies. And it's not just Catholics, it's Orthodox. Many Protestant uh, denominations baptize babies and Catholics. The understanding of this comes from John 3, 5, where Jesus says you must be born again of water and the Spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. So if you're not born of water and the Spirit, then you're not going to go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. Okay, you've just heard this gentleman saying that if uh, you can't go to heaven unless you're baptized. I don't think that is right. I don't think the Bible teaches that. Remember the verse that he just mentioned here in John chapter 3 verse 5 where it says that 
Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Notice that he didn't mention baptism. He talked about being born again. Being born again, born of water and the Spirit. So there's a symbolism here. Baptism saves no one. We are not saved by baptism. We are saved by God's grace. But this is what we need. We need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. If you repent and believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's Mark 16 verse 16. In Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So when we get baptized, that, uh, that deed of being baptized is not the one, what, it's not what saves us. What saves us is having a belief, faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Christians are expected, even commanded, to be baptized. However, the act of baptism itself is an expression of faith and obedience, not the means of salvation. We have many examples of people who did not get baptized and would be saved, including Abraham, Moses, or the patriarchs, really. We see, we know that they did not get baptized. The thief on the cross and all those who believed but did not get a chance of getting baptized. Do you want to tell me that they will not be saved? God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. God wants us to repent and be born again, not necessarily be baptized. But baptism is very important. Don't get me wrong. It is very important. We need to get baptized but what is more important than getting baptized is being born again because baptism symbolizes dying to sin and being raised up again so being born again let's continue it really refers to baptism so if you are not baptized in a sense you cannot go to heaven and if you are baptized you can you have to be reborn of water and the spirit and we see this in Romans chapter 6 where it says that if you are buried with Christ through baptism then you can also live with him through the resurrection and you are born again to new life through baptism so we want children to go to heaven and so we have them baptized as early as possible we want them to be renewed nude in Christ and have original sin forgiven. Now, the second point he mentions here is that uh, the original sin, we need to get baptized, we need to get babies baptized so that their original sin can be forgiven. Is this true? Would God keep a baby out of heaven because of something Adam did and its mother did not do? Certainly not. What is original sin? Uh, original sin is not a sin of action. So we are not punished for, original sin does not mean that we are punished for doing something. We did not, we were not involved in Adam's sin, Adam and Eve's sin against God. Instead, original sin is a deprivation. It is a deprivation of the holiness and grace that we need in order to have friendship with God. So Adam and Eve had these preternatural gifts, this gift of friendship with God, uh, that also protected them from things like death. And so this was given to them, and they could have passed these spiritual gifts along to their children. But because they disobeyed God, those gifts were revoked and lost, and so they could not pass them on to their children. So their children suffer, but they are not punished. In the same way that somebody who wins a lottery might be rich, and suppose they try to cheat and win more money from the lottery. If they are caught, they might have to forfeit all of the money back. And so their descendants will be poor now. The descendants are punished indirectly. They're not punished legally, but they suffer as a consequence of what their ancestors have done. And that's similar with human beings when it comes to original sin. This is how the Catholics define the original sin. Original sin also describes it as ancestral sin is a view of the nature of sin in which humanity has existed since the fall of man. 
original sin arose from Adam and Eve's transgression in Eden, the sin of disobedience in eating of the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, can be explained as sin and its effects as we all possess in God's eyes as a direct result of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. Original sin is called sin only in analogical sense. It is a sin contracted and not sin committed, a state, not an act. If it is a state and not an act, therefore it means that God cannot really hold babies accountable for things that they did not do. We all know that we are born as sinful beings. In Psalm 51 verse 5, uh, the Bible says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And in Romans 5, 12, it continues to uh, elaborate on this point that therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So Adam sinned and he introduced death in um, sin into the world and sin brought death uh, into the world. But God will not punish babies because they have not been baptized. Because in Revelation chapter 22 verse 12, the Bible says, Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So God will not punish people who have not committed sin. The soul that commits sin is the soul that will die. And babies, I don't think they commit sin because they have no knowledge of sin or knowledge of good and evil. Let's continue with the video. The reality is that Colossians chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 talk about how baptism is the new circumcision. And we know that circumcision was done at eight days old. So as a very newborn baby, you were circumcised in the Old Testament. And the New Testament says that baptism replaces circumcision. Baptism is the new circumcision. Is this true? In Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 and 12 the Bible says in him we are also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were when you were circumcised by Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead here is talking about circumcision but not the circumcision that is performed by human hands like they were doing back in the old what does this mean circumcision was important in back in the day but here the bible really constantly emphasizes especially in the new testament about the circumcision but the circumcision of the heart in romans 2 verse 28 and 29 a person is not a jew who is on a person is not a jew who is one only outwardly nor in circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So in the Bible, circumcision almost always refers to a physical act, and this is true of Paul's writings as well. But in at least three passages, he alludes to a circumcision of the heart, a spiritual circumcision. Let's listen to what Vodi has to say about this circumcision. In the New Covenant, we see talk of circumcision as well. But in the New Covenant, it is a circumcision of the heart. And this is where I would disagree with my Presbyterian brethren who want to argue basically that it's because of this idea of circumcision being carried over into the new covenant that we give baptism, which is the new circumcision, to infants in order to identify them with the covenant people just like the children of the Israelites were identified with the covenant people. Small problem. There is circumcision in the new covenant. And it's not baptism. It is the circumcision of the heart. The new covenant is not like the Abrahamic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, you have two peoples. You have one that are his children according to the flesh, and you have the other who are his children according to the promise. This is clear to us in Galatians. In the new covenant, 
everyone is circumcised. Just like in the old covenant, everyone is circumcised. But in the new covenant, it's the circumcision of the heart. Not everyone is part of the new covenant. Only believers are part of the new covenant. Which is why only believers are baptized. We are saying you are now part of the covenant people of God because you have come to him by faith and you have been baptized. Another important thing to note here is that only males were circumcised. But in baptism, males and females are instructed to get baptized. So all believers have experienced the circumcision of the heart by Christ, not only males, everybody. So there's no way you can equate by circumcision to baptism because circumcision was only for young boys. And sometimes all people, uh, grown, grown ups, would get circumcised as well. But it was mainly for males. But baptism that Jesus is talking about is for everybody. It's the baptism of the heart. Everybody needs to get a heart renewal, a heart transplant. Everybody needs to be born again, not only men. So remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and onward, Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you. A baby can't repent. Jesus said himself in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Go therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples, better translation of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So baptism is a symbol of repentance of sin, of belief, and becoming part of God's family, His church. We're baptized into the body of the church. We do see that in Acts 2.38 and 2.39, the people were asking Peter what they needed to do to be saved. And Peter said, you have to repent of your sins and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And he said, this promise is for you and your children. So he wasn't restricting it just for adults, but for children. Likewise, in Acts 16.33, a guard in prison converted and was baptized. But the Bible doesn't say he was baptized. It says he and his whole family was baptized. 1 Corinthians 1.16 says the exact same thing about the household of Stephanus. Acts 16.15 likewise says a whole family was baptized as well. The whole entire household was baptized. Now notice in any of these verses, it could have said the husband and wife were baptized or Stephanus alone was baptized, but it took great pains to say that their whole families, in every case, their families were baptized because that's the way it was. When the father converted, the whole family converted and the whole family received baptism all the way from the father, all the way down to the children. Okay, once again, as you just heard, he's talking about household baptism. Is this something that we see evidence of in the Bible? Let's see, in Acts chapter 10, verse 24 to 48, it, there is accounts of Cornelius and his relatives and close friends hearing the gospel and being baptized. In Acts chapter 16, there are two sets of baptisms. The baptism of the member of Lydia's family in verse 15, and also the baptism of the Philippian jailer and all his family in verse 33. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, he mentioned this one. Paul revealed that the he baptized members of the household of Stephanus. So these are the household baptisms that we, we see in the Bible. So those who use the passage to justify in, infant baptism base their claims upon two assumptions. They say that they assume that infants were present in each of these households. And also they assume that the infants were baptized. In each example, of household baptism, the people who were baptized were ones who had been taught what they needed to do in order to receive salvation. They were the people who could hear and understand the word of God and devote themselves to the ministry of the saints. So infant baptism takes a big assumptions as to what happened there and who got baptized. But the Bible doesn't really say for sure that the babies were there and the babies were baptized. Let me uh, share a video of uh, Mike Winger of what he says about this 
topic right here. Cornelius, we read about this guy Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11. Peter goes to him and he's the first like real Gentile who's re rec publicly recognized as being included in the, um, in the, the gospel, the reception of the gospel of Christ without being, becoming a Jew. It's really interesting passage. Um, but Acts 11, 14, let's highlight this because Peter goes and he preaches to everyone that's in Cornelius' place. And Acts 11, 14 indicates that Peter is going to declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your whole household. So this is kind of the end of the passage, but I want to highlight this, that this is the first household reference in Acts. And it's a reference to how his whole household will in fact be saved. So when we get to Acts chapter 10, verse 2, we read this about Cornelius backing up a bit, um, that he's a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God continually, or prayed continually to God. He fears God with all his household. So this gives us a little bit of a, uh, an insight. What does Acts 11 mean when it says, you and all your household will be saved? Does it mean infants? Well, in Acts 11, 14, it says all household. In Acts 10, 2, it says all his household. And it clearly refers to a group of people who fear God. Well, fearing God isn't really a quality infants have. Now, some will argue that they do, and I think that I personally think that that's a little strange. Um, and I like to hear them build a careful case for that sort of thing. Um, but I would say, you know, no, I don't think infants are included in this concept. He feared God with all his household. So they're all recognizing that the God of Israel is the true God of creation. And this is the, he's not Jewish, but he believes. This is his starting point when he's going to hear the gospel of Christ. We also get from verse 7 that household probably also includes, though it may not include infants here, um, let's see, Acts 10, 7, two of his household servants. So this may be an indicator, I'm not going to look at the Greek right now, it takes too much time on my, during the live stream, but that may be an indicator that um, servants themselves are included in the concept of the household. And I think that this we can make clear later on when we talk about Caesar's household, that servants are actually included in the, um, in the household. So the household would actually be a lot bigger than just referring to um, his kids or something like that. Now, when Peter arrives, Acts 10.33, here's what he's told. Peter is told by them, see, uh, so I sent for you to come at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Cornelius describes everyone that's gathered and they're all there to hear. Now we're going to say that infants have to understand Peter to be able to be present and included in the household comments of the book of Acts regarding to Cornelius. They're present to hear. And infants are obviously not hearing Peter in a comprehension sense. And hearing without understanding is, is meaningless. It's fruitless. It's not what he's talking about in the passage. So there's two options I see for the household of Cornelius. Either there's no infants there, which then all the passages make sense, all the verses. Or infants are there, but they're ignored because we just assume that they're not being talked about when you say household and what a household is doing because infants are just being drug along everywhere. <laughs> they're not really making any choices. They're not making decisions. It's like when someone's got a little infant baby and they're like, hey, tell grandma we said hi. We all said hi. Our household said hi. They don't mean that like our three-day-old baby said hi and then grandma's like, what? The three-day-old baby's talking now? Like, obviously we just talk past the infants. We don't, we don't care about them. We just recognize they're not part of these inclusive terms. So those are the two options. There's no infants or they're not part of these inclusive terms when they say things like, we're all gathered to hear or the whole household will be saved. Then in uh, Acts 10, 44, we get a little more detail on this stuff. And it makes it even harder to try to squeeze infants into the passage, to be honest. Acts 10, 44 says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Remember he said they were all there to hear and they all heard the word and the Holy Spirit fell on all the ones who heard the word. Did the Holy Spirit fall on the infants? And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the, even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, by the way, let me just slow down, right? The Holy Spirit's poured out and they heard them. Who's the them? The one on whom the Holy Spirit fell, which was all who heard, all of them. And they heard them speaking in tongues. So now we have infants speaking in tongues, if they're in this passage. And they're extolling God. So now we have infants speaking in tongues and extolling God. And if you want to quote the psalm, like, out of, out of the mouths of nursing, nursing infants, you've perfected praise. I think you're misunderstanding the psalm here and taking it beyond its intended meaning. Uh, verse 47. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have just received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Notice who gets to be baptized? The ones who receive the Spirit. There's, 
So either the infant spoke in tongues, heard the word, received the spirit, they did all of these above, all of the above, or they're not included in this passage. And so I think the most obvious thing is they were not included. Let's, let's look at the second section that we've got, and that's Acts 16, starting in verse 31. And this is about the Philippian jailer. This uh, jailer, he ends up getting saved. It's a pretty remarkable story, pretty wonderful conversion. But when he gets saved, look at what happens in verse 31. Um, here he's told, believe in the Lord Jesus, you and you will be saved, you and your household. So here's a message to this jailer, like, you and your household, they will be saved, believe in the Lord Jesus. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, to all who were in his house, to all who were in his house. So here's another household passage and they spoke the word to all. And, and the implication here is that they're preaching to infants and thinking that infants can understand them and then make a decision about believing or rejecting and then somehow they know that they've received the word like they because people who baptize infants never know if, if they've even if you preach the gospel to them it, it just gets weird right do they do they hear it and understand it and how do you know they understood it and they make do, are they making a decision to believe because the people that are being talked about here seem to be making those choices so they spoke to all who were in his house and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. All his family, all his household are the ones who heard the word. So they were cognizant, not infants it seems. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So now they're all rejoicing. They're all rejoicing. So the infants are hearing the word, understanding the word, choosing to believe and rejoicing and celebrating with, with not just like... You know, like when you laugh and your baby laughs, it's not that kind of rejoicing. They're rejoicing that he had believed in God. So they have a reason in their mind. Oh, dad believes. And they're like a five day old baby or something. And that doesn't make any sense. Um, it's just, we're pushing the text beyond what seems to be the obvious meaning. The conclusion here is if infants are in the house, they're ignored in the rejoicing, the hearing and the believing. It's reasonable to think they're also ignored in the baptizing. Um, it's weird to try to pick these passages apart to mean something different. The next one is uh, Acts, uh, also Acts chapter 6, verse 15. And this one's about Lydia, and it's really, really short. Lydia, it says in verse 15, <clears throat> after she heard the word, um, after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. So they were on their way to go over and, you know, be with Lydia. And now, there's, what are the reasons to think that an infant is being baptized here? Keep in mind, we don't have any clear text of scripture saying that infants should be baptized. But what's the reason? The reasoning is the word household is here and we should just assume that households include infants. Even though we have, it seems, from the context of the other ones, other clearer, more detailed passages in Acts, that the word household just ignores infants or doesn't include them. I, I'm inclined to think they just ignore the infants when they're referring to households. So let's evaluate this a little more. Here's some reasons to think otherwise in Lydia's case. Household could naturally ignore infants. Okay, that, I've already made the case for that. Um, also, infants are not mentioned specifically. It's assumed, and it's a lot to assume since you want to base a regulatory church practice on that assumption. There's a decent chance also that Lydia was unmarried or past childbearing or didn't have kids or that her kids were just full grown. And one of the reasons for this is she hosted them, which seems a little counterculture. After um, she was baptized, She's the one who invited them to her house to stay there. She was the hostess when normally it would have been the man. I mean, the, the husband doesn't seem to be involved here. He's not even mentioned anywhere in this passage. The whole household's mentioned, but not the husband specifically, whereas the husband's highlighted in the other stories when a, when a whole group of people convert. So maybe he wasn't around, maybe he'd died, maybe she was never married. That's, these are all possible things. I mean, she's a businesswoman. And so if she doesn't have kids, though, then who's her household? Well, it could include the servants, or it could include grown children if, if, they're, uh, if the husband had passed away. Other relatives of hers, cousins, um, someone else she was taking care of. It could include any of, the, any of the above. Here is the takeaway from this lesson. The takeaway is repentance. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, the Bible says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Peter here was calling people to repent 
and be baptized. You don't just get baptized. You have to repent and then show your repentance, a proof of your repentance by getting baptized. Baptism should follow an individual's personal confession of faith, which infants are not capable of making. So you can baptize infants. The Bible doesn't say that we shouldn't baptize them. But at the same time, the Bible doesn't say that we should baptize them. What the Bible says specifically is that people should hear the word, repent, and then be baptized. This is what I wanted to share with you today. Please share and like this video. And also let me know what you think in the comment section below. God bless you all. See you in the next video.